Hi, my name's Phil, I like to talk about politics, and this is the Political Post Box, where I pick a few of the more engaged with comments from the past week, and add my own thoughts to them as well. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, then please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So, first of all, rather than going straight into the first one, um, something very odd has happened, and... Odd things are happening from my point of view on my own channel in the dashboard uh, this week that I don't know whether this is just affecting me or if it's affected you guys and you've noticed or something like that. Um, let me just show you a little image here. This is taken from the comment section on a load of videos from the past week. And it's been hitting this for the past few weeks. And you look at it, you think, oh, there's one there with 750 comments, that's fine. But then there's like 14 threes. No one commenting on your videos, Phil. Yes, they are. <laughs> what, what's happening? is when I go into the comments and I, there's like a thousand, so up to one and a half thousand comments in review. Now, what normally happens is when you post a comment on the channel, if the YouTube algorithm thinks, oh, that might be a little bit iffy, um, they'll put it into the review thing. Now, I can manually okay them all, but... I, I, <laughs> that has to be done on an individual basis on every single one. And then there's another one that goes into spam as well. So occasionally when people think I'm deleting their comments, by the way, I'm not at all. It's just going into the review thing. So there are certain things if you type, um, you know, and you know it's a little bit dodgy, try and rephrase it because the YouTube algorithm will probably grab it. And most of the time I don't even peek in the under review because I have more comments than I can realistically read anyway, just that have got through normally. But in the last week, it's been really weird. It has been exceptionally weird. Um, and again, I don't know, because it's hit the, like, the last two weeks worth of videos, this, but it didn't happen over the last two weeks. It's not like, say, videos last Monday weren't showing for me, or Friday, all the way up to Friday before I went away for the weekend. It's only happened this weekend. So it may just be something on my dashboard that's messing about, or it may be something else. But just in case it's happening for everyone, and it's not just me, and you think... Oh, he's deleted all my comments. What's he doing? I haven't done anything. This is YouTube. Uh, hopefully it will rectify itself. I've noticed that this weekend seemed to be fine. Uh, anyway, on to the first one, actual one. So Boris Johnson here said, well, some, someone commenting on Boris Johnson's statement that his mandate was that the Brexit deal was oven ready. This is what he said before the general election. He did indeed. And where did this statement come from, this oven ready thing? It's because he wanted to distinguish between himself and Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn was saying, look, this form of Brexit's going to crush jobs and all the rest of it. I want to negotiate a better Brexit deal. And Boris Johnson was saying, well, you know, the thing about that is if you vote for that, you don't know what that's going to be because he hasn't carried out any negotiations. It could be anything, uh, which is a little bit strange because he has come up with a form of Brexit that was not even discussed before the Brexit referendum, and yet apparently is the Brexit that people voted for, you would only assume that if you could not conceive that there are two possible Brexits. So Boris Johnson, on the one hand, was basically saying, this is Brexit, this is what people voted for, as if Brexit is just one thing. The Brexit means Brexit thing, although that wasn't Boris Johnson that came up with that, at least I assume it wasn't. Uh, but on the other hand, he's saying, well, actually, there are different forms of Brexit, and Jeremy Corbyn, you don't know what you're buying, so you better vote for mine. So he had this idea that it was oven ready and it meant it was all ready to go. And yet here we are several, well, two and a half months after the general election. And he hasn't even got a trade proposal for the EU. He published something last week, which was um, a series of would likes without any proposal on how they were to be achieved. There was no like detail in them. You know, if you compare it to the EU's, for example, or even compare it to the United States' publication last February when they were saying what they wanted of a US-UK trade deal as well, there were specific proposals with how it was to be accomplished. Obviously, you know, there are always some details to be negotiated, but there was at least a proposal. From us, none. And yet, apparently, our deal was oven ready. That meant it was ready to go. That meant it was, it was just a formality. Uh, negotiating the finer points of it. Just that, there was just little tweaks, little tiny areas where the EU and the UK government were going to negotiate the little tweaks before it was all ready for the end of this year. And yet, here we have uh, 
it turns out this oven ready deal is still a live chicken. <laughs> Hasn't even been plucked yet or knocked on the head and um, certainly not ready to go. But again, this is, and this is one of the most maddening things. It's like just yet again, we're just gonna say, oh, it looks like Boris Johnson lied. But I almost don't, I mean, I'm still always going to point out the inconsistencies as people should because it has to be kept up, that little background noise of every time Boris Johnson lies, which is basically every time he says something, it needs to be called out. And, and, and when you have to accept the fact that he's lied, and it might be a couple of months after the lie was first told, you have to come back to it, you do have to. But you sometimes wonder what's the point, because for a lot of people, his supporters, you know, in the general election were voting Conservative, and if you said to them, Boris Johnson's lying to you, you know, they said, yeah, we know. They were fine with that because as far as they were concerned, he was having to lie. Um, but, but he had their backs. He was doing what was right and he was just lying because apparently that's just how it was done. But I think what we have to remember is that although there's a lot of, or maybe a, a minority of noisy people who will give you the impression that there's loads and loads of people that are going to vote for him despite that, Quite a lot of people are not aware of these lies. A lot of people are not very well informed at all. So it is always worth pointing these things out. On to the next one. Uh, so it says, uh, even if I agree with you on so many things, BBC paid service should go. I assume this means the license fee. Why should we pay for something we don't use just because I have a mobile phone and I can? I prefer to use the money for police and or health services that we all need and let TV do whatever. And second, I hate Brexit. Well, let's come to the first one first before I read the second, as it's two statements. So here's the thing. When you use the argument, why should I pay for something I don't use? And the argument is used. It is used by people on the right of politics. It's used by conservatives in lots of different countries, uh, and certainly in the UK. The same argument, you, you say, why isn't the money used for, like, I'd rather it was used on the health service than the police. Well, the same argument means we shouldn't have public health service or police either. That's the thing. Why should we pay for something we don't use? You know, if you're not, I mean, I don't, well, I do use the BBC, uh, but the website rather than television. But let's say that didn't exist and I wasn't watching television either. I mean, at the moment, I've not used the police for a while. I've not had to report a crime for a few years. So I'm not using the police. Why should I pay for the police? And, and if you're perfectly fit and healthy at the moment, you could say, well, I'm not using the health service at the moment. Why should I pay for the health service? You know, I'm not old or vulnerable in any other way at the moment, so why should I pay for social care? And, and before you know it, there isn't a single public service that would be funded. The reason why we should pay for, for public services is because we will need them. At some point, we will need them. The BBC is needed. In its current form, it is not fulfilling its remit. It, it's failing. But it is there to hold government to account. Or the, the political news team is there to hold government to account. And that's the only bit, bear in mind, that is failing in the BBC. The rest of it. I'm not saying it's all marvellous. I'm not saying it couldn't do with tweaks here and there as well. But no one's really got it in for other parts of the BBC. This is purely the political news team, that small part of the BBC, small but crucial part, the really important public service it's delivering in, in giving people the news in an objective and fair way that it is not doing. But just as if the healthcare system, I mean, at the moment, the healthcare system is also failing because, you know, it can't cope with this winter anyway. It hadn't recovered from the previous winter. And, and then the new winter came along and they had no extra capacity. Um, you know, there's talk at the moment for coronavirus, there's like 15 beds. That's it. That's your lot. Of course, because we don't have the capacity. We're in the middle of winter. We've already got, without the coronavirus, normal winter pressures and hospitals cannot cope with them, the healthcare system is not coping. But do we look at that and go, well, it's failing and I'm fit and healthy at the moment, so why should we pay for it? Why don't we just scrap the taxation, let it fund itself, let it turn into a super booper, uh, which is a private healthcare company in this country. Um, but people wouldn't say that, would they? They wouldn't say that of the NHS. And that is because fundamentally they know that they are going to need the NHS at some point. We all need healthcare at some point. And then some people will say, well, I will never watch the BBC. Okay, fair enough, but it is still needed. 
because there are millions of people who do. It is the most watched news media in the country. And if it was fair and objective, then it would be a powerful force for good. The fact that it's not being is not a reason to get rid of it because what it would be replaced with is even worse. And I'm not saying we should keep it because what will replace it is even worse. What I'm saying is it's easy to reform. Obviously, it's not going to be reformed while we've got this current government. But there will be a government in the future that will hopefully reform it. Now, I mean, I don't know. There could be any number of things on their in-tray and they may not consider the BBC to be high enough. That would be foolish. But in, it can be, it is there to be reformed. But that's my view. Second statement. Let's go on to this really quickly then. It says, uh, I hate Brexit and Boris, but I like that he's using Huawei. I hate bullying. This is what other countries do with Huawei as long as they don't have um, proof that they spy. I mean, they do. <laughs> We've been, our security services know that they do. Um, I don't know enough about it, so I'm not going to add any more to that. But you, you, had, you had the statement in there. I really picked this for the first statement, but the second statement was there. So I'll, I'll just say that's just my thoughts on that anyway. Um, next one. It says, you discuss our food production problem. What about Spain? They have huge production areas to supply the UK with fresh fruit and vegetables. Are they going to stop supplying us? Don't think so in the short term. Without our markets, the EU would have a surplus. Thinking the Spanish feels they need us as much as we need them. Is Boris building huge heated greenhouses? No, he's not. In fact, of course, I mean, this. you made this comment last week before this weekend's announcement that the government are basically uh, discovering that they don't even need the farming industry. They've asked the question, do we actually need to save the farming industry? Is it really that important to the UK economy? The answer has come back no. So presumably that means their policy is going to be to stuff them. I mean, it already has been, but you know, even more so. Now, here's the thing. You say, you know, there's, there's, we get goods import from Spain. We get a great many imported from the Netherlands. You know, we, we, we export goods, they export to us. Are Spanish suppliers suddenly going to stop supplying us? Not by choice, no, because that would be silly. Why would they do that? In fact, given that we're going to knacker our own farming industry, the likelihood is we're going to need to import more food as well. So that means they may even be able to charge a higher price to supply us. Of course, they want to keep us as a customer. No one is suggesting that we're going to struggle to get EU food into the country because EU farmers will go, oh, I don't want to supply them. No, it's because they won't physically be able to get the food into the country. This is the situation. And, and so we've been told um, by Hauliers that lorries coming into the country where checks are going to be needed. If those checks take just a few minutes, then that will result in 17 mile tailbacks at Dover, which represents several days worth of tailbacks. Now, with a lot of goods, that is going to mean that we're going to struggle to get quite a lot of goods into the countries, be simply because lorry drivers will refuse to do the UK run. Not all, but there'll be plenty there that'll go, well, I'm not going to do that. For those who do, they're obviously going to need to be paid more. That means the cost of transporting those goods to the UK increases because your lorry is taking longer to get it there. But for food, it isn't just a case of throwing more money at the suppliers and the, the hauliers more specifically and saying, yeah, that's OK. We know you're going to be stuck there. Here's some more money. Just bring it to us when you can. Because food goes off. If you're talking about fresh fruit and vegetables, it goes off. Um, so that's what stops us getting it in and, and, and that's what people need to appreciate, you know, because on the, as, as things are going at the moment, the current trajectory and any number of things can change. But the current trajectory is that everything at the moment is swing. You know, we can buy stuff at the EU and it can be transported. No problem at all. The just in time supply chain is fine. But on the 1st of January, 2021, it all ends overnight. Overnight, it all ends. And not only will there be tariffs on those foods raising the cost, unless the government choose to reduce tariffs on those goods to zero, which it can do, but it can't just do it for the EU. If the British government decides to reduce tariffs on particular commodities, fresh fruit and veg, uh, they have to do it for the whole world. 
but the, yeah, they may do that. And then that's not an issue, but you are going to be stuck at customs and the food is going to spoil and that is what is going to stop us getting it. And, and overnight, overnight. What is it that someone said? I can't remember the details now. It's going to be embarrassing because it's quite a famous quote. Someone said like any society is only like so many meals away from anarchy or something like that. And that's, you know, that's the realistic problem we have. Now, you know, don't get me wrong. We import about 50% of our food. And we're not suddenly going to not be getting that 50% of the food. Some of it will get through. It's just that nowhere near enough of it. That is the problem. But anyway, banged on about that enough. Next one. A simpler, fairer system. So before I go into the rest of the comment, this is relating to the immigration rules, which the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, is, is indeed describing as a simple, simpler, fairer system. And they said, wasn't that what they said about universal credit and look how that worked out? Now, universal credit, for those who don't know, maybe outside of the UK, was a system introduced by the government, which is not necessarily evil in concept, of, you know, because if you're unemployed or even if you are unemployed, because the, the, the reality of modern Britain is you can be doing full time work and not earning enough to live on, not earning the living wage. So you have access to benefits and it may be top up benefits or you may be completely unemployed and you may need access to tax credits or you may need access to job seekers allowance or housing benefit, uh, you know, child tax credits, whatever. And and the Conservatives said, well, it would be much simpler if we just roll these into one benefit. So there's just one payment. Now, that sounds perfectly reasonable and can be perfectly reasonable. The other thing they said was that nobody would lose out. They will guarantee that nobody will end up on less money. Now, this hasn't been rolled out across the whole country. They would like to, but they are not able to because of two reasons. First of all, the computer system doesn't actually work properly, uh, but that hasn't stopped them rolling it out in places and keep doing so. And the other thing is that the Conservatives are highly skilled at knowing how just how far they can push a population. Their policies are always extremely damaging for the general population, but they also understand if they're only hitting a minority of people at a time, particularly in demographics that don't traditionally vote in large numbers, this is why you should vote in large numbers. Peasants. <laughs> um, that is, um, they, they know that if they just do that, the majority of people aren't being hurt and, and they won't suffer at the ballot box. If they were to roll it out all at once, they're hurting a lot of people and it will generate a lot of noise and a lot more deaths than it already is. Remember, this is, has led to deaths. And I'll tell you another thing it's led to. Everywhere, everywhere where universal credit is rolled out, you get a sudden and massive uptick in, uh, in people needing to use food banks. Because people do end up with less and, and it's not enough. It's not enough to live on. Um, and, but, but the statement here about the immigration rules, uh, liken it to saying a simpler, fairer system, wasn't that what they claimed about universal credit and look how well that turned out, turned out. You're sort of going with the assumption here that the government should have learnt as if universal credit didn't work out or maybe we should have another think about this immigration rules because maybe we're making the same mistake. Universal credit is not being a failure from the point of view of the Conservative government. It is a human failure. It is not a political failure. It has done what they wanted it to do. It is saving them money. It is, it is making people destitute and it is plunging people into poverty, even working people into poverty. Uh, well, they were already there, but much deeper into poverty. But what it is not doing um, is costing the taxpayer anymore, which is what they want. They want to reduce taxes and therefore reduce the public burden. Now obviously their policies also end up causing lots of people to be on lower wages because wages have stagnated so they they haven't actually grown. In, in fact they've only just got up to pre-2008 values now. Um, so they've stagnated for all that time which means in real terms your wages have gone down. If your wages stay, or stay the same or go up by less than inflation they're actually coming down in real terms because 
everything's costing more. So the amount of disposable income you have is less if you even had disposable income. And if you don't have disposable income, that's when the food banks are needed. And um, But from the Conservatives' point of view, they don't care about that. And it's the same with the immigration rules. Where they do care about it, if an industry makes them care about it, they'll just throw exceptions in. These immigration rules that they're trumpeting won't actually be the immigration rules that are applied because there's always exceptions to rules. They'll just throw some exceptions in. Let's say the farming industry really got pissed off. Someone suggested blocking all the roads with tractors and stuff like that and causing absolute mayhem. And let's say the farming, in, which is uh, supports the Conservative Party, so it's actually maddening they're not doing this already. I would have thought that Boris Johnson would be falling over himself to help the farming industry. Huge whole communities all dependent upon farming that vote Conservative. It seems a madness to me. Maybe he knows something I don't. But, you know, he could easily just make exception for migrant workers, for farmers. It's like, you know, trying to come into the country, you're an uns unskilled migrant. Yeah, you're not coming in. What, what work is it, by the way? Oh, you're going to pick fruit in a field. Oh, yeah, in you come then. You're an exception. Easy to do that. Anyway, next one. <laughs> Uh, it says, have you watched the YouTube video? Ian Duncan Smith, EU is panicking. The level of delusion is off the charts. I haven't seen that specific video. I have seen Ian Duncan Smith's uh, comments. I mean, you know, this was sort of debunked really last week, wasn't it? The uh, EU panicking notion. It was, it was literally like one day the EU's panicking. It's in complete disarray. The next day the EU presented their um, agreed negotiating position. But in terms of the general level of delusion, in terms of, you know, so-called EU panic and all the rest of it, unfortunately, it's not going to go away until we are hit hard, until we are booted up the arse good and hard. There are a reduced number, but still an excessive number of people who are just utterly convinced, despite all the evidence, but people aren't paying attention to the evidence, that the EU is going to crumble at the last minute and give us this deal because they have no notion of the fact that the deal we're asking for is, is impossible politically and economically. Uh, and this has always been the problem. And they had the same, and, and they're not at all put off by the fact they said the same thing about the withdrawal agreement. Oh, the EU will crack and give us everything they want. They didn't. You know, even with Boris Johnson, they didn't. What happened for Boris Johnson to get his withdrawal agreement agreed by the EU? He had to ensure that there'd be no hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland by putting the border in the Irish Sea. Never mind what he says, that's where it is. And also, he had to give them a load of money. Like, seriously. All of the British money in the European Central Bank, which after Brexit we would have got back. Um, yeah, you know, there's the settlement, but, but, but that was our money, we were going to get that back. Boris Johnson agreed to give it up. Billions, absolute billions. Well, he doesn't care. He's not bothered. It's not his money. And um, so, but these people aren't aware of these things. So they'll just keep doing that. And they will not face reality until very likely the 1st of January 2021. Again, assuming we're on this same trajectory by then. And again, I have to keep saying any number of things can change. But at the moment, that seems to be Boris Johnson's intention. The only reason why there's any pause for thought is because although I don't buy the school of thought that of course Boris Johnson will not go through with this because it will be so damaging that it will be political suicide. I, I don't think he sees that. And, and perception is everything in politics. It's absolutely everything. If he does not believe that his form of Brexit will be politically damaging to him, he will absolutely go through with it. Absolutely. So the question is, does he realise how politically damaging it is or not? And the second question is, is it politically damaging? Are there enough sheeple in this country to still vote him in at the next general election? That is the big question. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do not believe that Boris Johnson is fully seized of the notion that he cannot go through with his hard Brexit. I think he thinks he can. If something changes his mind in the next year, and it wouldn't take long to extend the transition period, but he may see that as being politically damaging to him because he promised he wouldn't do it. And he's going to keep promising he won't do it. 
in June, he's, he's promised to walk away from the talks if the EU don't look like they're going to give him his so-called Canada deal, which they're not. So that means in June he's walking away from the talks. Will he? Will he? Anyway. Um, last one, I think. Here we go. So it says, uh, I might have to edit this one a little bit. Uh, saying that leave voters should be left to lie in their own piss sodden beds is like saying that inexperienced young drivers should go out and have major road smash ups because that's the only way they'll understand the consequences of bad driving. Yet meanwhile, like the motorists who've got hit by the careless driver and suffers no, through no fault of their own, we all have to endure the consequences of this pile. I don't think that blaming uh, like a Brexiteer is helpful. Now, I don't, on that last point, I'll agree, but we'll come to the first one. I don't think the analogy is quite right, but let's say we go with it. I mean, by if you are going to blame those who support Brexit, when we say Brexit, I mean, obviously, these terms are not defined at all. When I say Brexiteer, I specifically mean someone who's pushed for Brexit. I distinguish it, although it's my definition because there's no set definition. I do distinguish it from a Leave supporter. A Leave supporter, from my point of view, is just someone who probably voted Leave. And, and regardless of whether they did or they didn't, they now support Leave at the moment. They're quite happy that we're leaving the EU. Uh, whereas when I say Brexiteer, and it is not defined... Um, I mean specifically someone who has pushed for it, uh, encouraged others to do it. Um, so blaming them, absolutely, because they've lied. Blaming Leave supporters, no. But in terms of, yeah, this, this analogy, um, it's not like saying that we think that inexperienced young drivers should go out and have major smash-ups. I would liken it more, if we're going to use the bad driver situation, that... Um, you're in the car with them and at the point at which they're driving badly and you're in the car with them, of course you do not wish them to crash because that's going to hurt you. This is why before we surrendered our membership, I was not, there were some Remainers who were thinking, look, do you know what? The country is divided and whether we leave or whether we stay, even if we had a people's vote and stayed, the country would still be divided. The only way to get... And you can't change the minds of the Remainers because, well, they're right. <laughs> um, the Brexiteers and the Leave supporters are the only ones whose minds you can change. But the only way they'll change that mind is by seeing it for themselves, seeing what their voters bought. And so there were Remainers even a year ago that were wishing the no deal Brexit upon us just because it was the quickest way of showing them the folly of, of, their, of their delusions. Um, but from my point of view, no, because it, it causes harm to innocence. And actually going with the bad, young bad driver thing, I mean, I've been a teacher for over 20 years, uh, teaching teenagers for over 20 years. You can bet I have come across a number of teenagers that have been uh, very badly hurt in, in car accidents, whether themselves driving badly or whether in a car with a friend that was driving badly. And, and I have to say, I've even known students killed by this. Um, so, but I'm also conscious of just the Brexit in general would kill British citizens as well. Uh, and that's why I was against it. Now it's a bit different. Now it's like the bad driver is heading towards a tree. You, you are going to hit the tree. That's all there is to it. You've got a few seconds, your brain is racing. It seems like an hour. You are going to hit the tree. At that point, I would say it's like hoping that that driver is the one that takes the brunt of the impact because why should I? I'm not the one driving like an idiot. Uh, so I think that's where the, the, the idea to blame comes in. However, um, it's not actually a bad driver situation. The analogy is not quite the same. It might be at the moment, but once we go over the cliff edge, for example, or into the tree... It, it, the analogy breaks down because then we, you know, we have to live with the other people. And that's where the blame is unhelpful. It's not that it's unjustified. I don't believe the blame is unjustified. But I do agree that it is unhelpful because at the end of the day, reconciliation is always more constructive than the blame game. Because we know what happens with blame on a, on a large scale, don't we? Uh, it causes the Middle East for a start. Uh, you, recrimination after recrimination, um, you know, and, and 
attack, which is a, a, a reaction to a previous slight, and they just feed each other and, and until people just stop and say, look, we need to be reconciled and that means we need to sort of let bygones be bygones and move forward, then you never do move forward. And there's so many parts of the world, uh, parts of the world not very far from, the, from dear old Blighty, in fact. In fact, part of the UK uh, needs to learn this lesson and I actually did start to learn the lesson over the last 20 years. But yeah, and that's why I say it's on help, just from a practical point of view. It's not helpful to blame. We can still blame the people lying because at the end of the day, they are still lying and they are still causing us damage. They are going to get the blame. But we're talking about the people at the very top. For the rest of the population, what we just need to do is, is at this point now, let them see what, what the result of it is. Carry on for the next 10 months. Let them see for themselves. Let them see either Boris Johnson completely go back on what he's been promising. And that way we're, we're still in the EU in 2021. We're not members, but we're still in the EU or let them take us out with the hardest of, of Brexits. And, and yeah, people are going to suffer, but they're going to suffer anyway. But the, the suffering is, is now beyond doubt. Um, just let people see it, is what I would say. Uh, and a hard Brexit will force people to see it. They won't be able to deny it. So anyway, uh, that is this week's political post box, post box even. I hope you found it enjoyable. If you did, don't forget to click the like button if you'd like to support the channel further. And please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.